Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm particularly excited as I'm a bit of a shipping nerd and the room view I have uh, from the hotel, I can see probably about 200 vessels. Some of them, I must say, uh, emitting quite a lot of dirty suits, but we'll, we'll come on to that, but we're, we're working on that one. Um, so as Peter mentioned, uh, we at, in the shipping operation have been going for around three years, but one of the reasons uh, we've created some of the ideas and solutions that I'm going to allude to has been through the intensive debate and discussion and, and sleeve roll up attitude we've seen at now uh, three CCWs, this being our fourth. Uh, so important for us to get the right people in the room, uh, particularly a wide selection of stakeholders uh, with different ideas and then to drill down into to, to what the barriers are and then try and knock those barriers over. Um, so let me very quickly give you a bit of context for shipping. As uh, Jose Maria alluded to, shipping is truly a gigaton scale, over a billion tons of CO2 emitted every year. If it was a country, somewhere in between Japan and Germany. Um, and just as importantly, growing on a, a very sort of steep curve towards tri tripling that by 2050. Uh, so, so, so very much a, a, a sort of extraterritorial in the sense that has regulation from the UN, very un unusual in that sense, uh, and has some classic market barriers, but not just carbon. Uh, shipping is one of the biggest polluters of sulfur oxide, nitrogen oxide, and particulate matter. And the suit we see from those ships out there is, is an illustration of that. Uh, and so as a byproduct of the work we're doing around energy efficiency, we're also looking at saving SOX, NOx, PM, uh, and black carbon. Uh, as also uh, Jose Maria alluded to earlier, we believe fundamentally that shipping has a large latent efficiency. Uh, as some of you will know, in other sectors, there's often quibbling over whether there's an opportunity to, to reduce emissions by 1 to 5%. In shipping, we're kind of arguing over whether it's 10, 15, 20, 20 plus percent. There is a substantial latent efficiency in the industry. And indeed, the United Nations, the International Maritime Organization, which is part of the United Nations, has declared there is a 25 to 75% in the industry. Now we're not trying to say that shipping isn't the most efficient way of moving cargo, but what we are saying is there's still a huge opportunity to make inroads into what is a sizable chunk of carbon. A bit of a crude slide, apologies, but I, I just wanted to touch on this. So some of you may be f familiar with the McKinsey cost curve, which in principle shows that on the left-hand side of the curve, there are a number of technological solutions to reducing carbon that are for profit. And if you crudely, as I have done, overlay uh, some of the technologies in shipping, you'll see that on the left-hand side of the curve, uh, this is a graph uh, supplied by the Classification Society, DMV, there are a number of technologies within the shipping industry that have uh, a short payback period. And just to list a few, uh, some are fairly blue sky. There's a kite on the left hand side. Everybody There's at Virgin a bubbles, love a challenge. I think what Virgin uh, well is about is taking on um, big conglomerates and just still moving into their territory lights, and seeing if we can shake them up. You know, we've managed to do that in the music business, we've managed to do it in the aviation business, in the mobile there, phone business. And I think information that where the people who work for Virgin get their passion from. Uh, on is being proud of the company they work for, being proud of the difference the that Virgin's Just making. Just take the boss cap fin for a minute, it sounds great. Um, it's a tiny little propeller that goes on the main propeller. Uh, it saves about 2 to 3%. It costs $70,000 to put on the ship. Um, Peter touched on this earlier. Shipping is a classic of the other sectors we're looking at. You are concentrating on the area in front of my feet, aren't you? Policy is there on new builds, which is great, but it's that's where I feel comfortable. It's not on that billion tons of CO2 I referred to earlier. Um, the technology is very much there. We've got very high fuel prices right now. But not, just, not just spiking, sustained high fuel prices. Five times the price of fuel that we saw four years ago. So that's inspired a generation of innovation around maritime technology. So for shipping, as with many other operations, capital, in our view, is the roadblock. Getting money flowing into an industry that has very little and putting that money into clean technology. So we set about 
with three main threads. The first, to solve the information flow, but there wasn't a way of telling an inefficient ship from a, an efficient ship. The second, to use that information uh, through, through charters and ports and investors, starting to differentiate in their decision-making pro processes based on efficiency and not just other measures. And then lastly, that, ca that, that capital hurdle. So, <clears throat> what did we do? Very simply, we thought we need to rate a ship, what, what, much like a fridge sticker. If we could put a, an A to G sticker on the side of a ship, we'd begin to start, start seeing the differential, and there is a substantial differential between efficient and inefficient ships. And so we called the European Union and we said, could we borrow your A to G rating? And they said, sure. We put it on the side of a ship, and this is a, a, a mock-up of the MMRs <coughs> uh, supplied to us by our friends at Maersk Line. Um, and on the left-hand side, you'll see our website, as, as Jose Maria mentioned, shippingefficiency.org. We have 60,000 vessels transparently, transparently available for anyone to see, open access. Uh, we've rated those 60,000 vessels based on their design efficiency. This is what it looks like. This particular vessel is a MERS vessel. It's a B-rated ship, um, very, much, very simple. Um, in, in principle, but behind that is a very complex uh, set of algorithms and methodologies. Um, and this vessel's uh, uh, C rating is based on the grams of CO2 it emits per nautical mile. And then if you start to make some progress and some upgrades around clean technology, uh, you can upgrade it. You can click on the site and you can add um, verification processes around the technology you fitted to that vessel. We've had over 5,000 upgrades already on the site, which we're very pleased about. So we had the information, and people were starting to look at it seriously. Um, as Jose Maria mentioned again, we're delighted to say that Cargill and others announced in October that in a policy, they will not, no longer use F and G rated ships. We're delighted about this. And, and to extend upon that, I can now tell you that about 20% of the non-container traffic uh, on the oceans is using this, uh, our A to G ratings as a policy piece. So we're, we're very pleased with that. And we've got a tremendous amount of coverage off the back of that. Uh, a real inroad, and uh, as I say, um, we hope that more, will, more charters will start to use this information. Now I'm going to stop speaking for about two minutes. And I want to just turn to CCW and how important it's been for shipping. We were in Berlin in October. It was a fabulous event. I'm sure we can beat it here. Uh, but one of the things we did as a more mature operation is really roll our sleeves up and see if we can develop the capital piece within the German market. We had the right stakeholders in place, um, and we looked to develop um, a self-financing, fuel-saving finance model. And this video hopefully illustrates some of what we did. At the Carbon Wall, we focus and concentrate on looking at the global economy and identifying sectors of that economy where carbon emissions could be reduced at the gigaton level while creating great business opportunities. So why should we? It's a billion tons of CO2 and on course and speed to go to a billion and a half. The sixth largest country in the world, if it was a country, and there is $70 billion a year in fuel that the shipping industry could be saving itself. There's a number of technological interventions that could be being made, harnessing renewable energy, wind, uh, solar, things to do with reducing the hydrodynamic drag of the hull itself, the improvements to the propulsion systems. Why isn't that happening? That was the problem that basically carbon war was set out to solve. Around 70% of the world's fuel bill is paid for not by the ship owners or operators, but by the charterer or shipper. And the charterer is largely uninformed in terms of which vessel to choose. One of the ways in which we dismantled the information barrier with respect to which ships were more efficient or less was by setting up the website www.shippingefficiency.org. It allows a corporation who is about to lease a ship to see what the efficiency rating is on that ship. The second stage was then nudging with sharp elbows to the demand side and saying, how many ships are you doing that is currently F's and G's? If you cut that out, you can save carbon and you save fuel and save money. And actually, two of the world's biggest ship charters, Cargill and Huntsman, 
have just signed a pledge not to use ships that are Fs and Gs in our rating system. That's immensely exciting. Choosing the more efficient vessels available to us, we are making a strong statement to the market. We hope that this action will demonstrate to ship owners that they can and should do more in terms of efficiency and that the market will reward them. Once those two pieces were in place, our focus is on getting capital and technology onto vessels. We've been working with some fantastic partners from multiple stakeholders, including the charter market, owners, banks, insurers, and the clean technology companies at CCW in Berlin, to see if we can devise a finance model whereby multiple vessels could be upgraded with the finance in place, the insurance in place, and we could see a catalytic change in the way the existing fleet um, retrofits. Uh, bringing together well, people from the industry that understand what can be done on these ships, uh, what's worth uh, investing, uh, that is something which can uh, effectively move forward things a lot. Our ambition for the two days at CCW is nothing short of having individual stakeholders that want to take us forward to sign a pledge to develop a consortium around self-finance and fuel saving. And this is just one fantastic example of what's, what's come out in the last two or three days, I think, that with uh, the, the kind of German determination and German mentality, I think we can not just be a, a talking shop, at least can be put, put into practice. <laughs> so, uh, no pressure on the shipping workshop uh, over the next two days. <laughs> Um, very quickly before I finish, I just want to illustrate some of our findings and what I'm really excited about this week is we have some new stakeholders, not least we have for example Sembawang, the largest retrofit shipyard in Singapore with us, which I believe, I'm sure, will, will provide some more dimensions to what we're doing. Uh, but we saw these, these participants as our key stakeholders and so we, we locked them in a room about this time last year and said how do we come up with a self-financing fuel saving model? And they came up with this, um, and I, I, I don't begin to expect you to understand it because I don't, but the basic principles are, are one or two things. Number one, we realized there are proven technologies out there in the market that the technology providers are willing to put a guarantee against, number one. Therefore, the insurers and the financers are suddenly very interested in insuring and financing this model. Uh, the second is that these, these, these technologies um, on, on, on the analysis we've done in a few vessels are showing approximately an average 10% fuel saving at a, a under a million dollars investment with approximately a two year payback. There is also a sort of second phase that Jose Maria alluded to which is a 20 to 30% reduction with more blue sky technology. And so the fuel pair here will take a slice of the upside if you like, a slice of the fuel saving the majority of the fuel saving goes back to this SPV, a special purpose vehicle, and the technology is paid off immediately at the start. So the financier gets his return, uh, the fuel pair gets a little, little slice, and the technology provider is paid for his technology up front. But it's not been easy. Um, ships move a lot, and I just want to give you a very quick snapshot before I finish of that some of the complexities around ensuring we get the data right. So if we put a ship in a dry dock, um, we have to understand uh, what the measurement is and what the methodology is pre-dry dock as to, un uh, as to ascertaining the emissions of that ship. So when we retrofit it, we also have good data post-dry dock to ensure we can make that comparison and, and satisfy the financier in terms of his payback. So this gives you a little bit of an analysis because every time a vessel goes into dry dock there is a natural fuel saving, the hull is blasted, there's some other things that happen. So it's not easy and I think that goes back to the, the fingers and thumb analogy. Uh, in shipping where it's not necessarily easy, these are effectively small power stations on the water and being on the water and in often inclement weather makes life incredibly difficult when you're putting a model together. So why only now? Well, there's good quality energy monitoring equipment for the first time ever. Um, there's sustained high fuel prices, as I, as I mentioned. This means the ROI on investment is suddenly very appealing to investors. Uh, there's a depressed market. We have many people from the industry in here today. Some of them, I would imagine, are really struggling. Um, shipping often reflects economic 
uh, woes, and in, in this current market, that's very much the case. We also have a two-tier market where, as I mentioned, the existing fleet is relatively inefficient to the new builds, uh, yet it's still emitting that gigaton of, of carbon. There are lots of clean technology companies, as I said, who are willing to put a guarantee on their technology uh, to, to counterparties. And in the case of some of the work we've been doing in Europe, we've discovered that some investors, private equity investors, not banks initially, are very interesting and more interested in these, what they describe as esoteric investments. But we believe in time, these will become more mainstream. And lastly, we have a shipping company that's willing to give us a ship to play with, in the sense uh, that the Carbon Warham and its partners are very hopeful that we'll have two vessels retrofitted this year uh, where we can prove to the market our model works. And those, those vessels will be retrofitted, we believe, in September and October and show around a 10% fuel saving, as I said, based not on the balance sheet of the owner, but on our third-party investment. One quick example, a VLCC, a very large crude carrier, uh, we, uh, we goes into dry dock after a five or 10 year cycle at $700 a tonne, is showing with two or three technologies an 8% fuel saving and a payback of just 13 months. Um, we believe we can make this scalable, as Peter mentioned. Um, we're not interested in just proving it on two or three vessels. Our pri private equity funds and partners are not either. They want to see this on hundreds and thousands of vessels and we're beginning to believe that can be done. So thank you very much for listening. I look forward to, to uh, reporting back uh, after a couple of days of exciting discussions. Thank you.